Namaste, and welcome to another episode of Yoga Vasishta. Yoga Vasishta is really an amazing scripture. It's so deep and rich, and its architecture is so magnificent and amazing. This is just the beginning, huh? the first book, which sets the scene, which creates the context for the rest of the book. But just going through this book is really amazing because it brings up everybody's issues. <laughs> so if you can get through this first section, <laughs> then you'll be more comfortable later on when we get to the spiritual part. But you have to consider these issues because they really refer to everybody's life. Let's take a look. The attendants of infancy are a lack of strength and sense, diseases, dangers, muteness and sensual desires joined with longings and helplessness. Childhood is chained to fretting, crying, fits of anger, craving, and every kind of incapacity, like an elephant chained to a post. The vexations that tease the infant breast are far greater than those which trouble us in youth and old age, or disturb one in disease, danger, or at the approach of death. The acts of a boy are like those of young animals, always restless and snubbed by everybody. Hence, boyhood is more intolerable than death itself. Boyhood is a period of gross ignorance, full of whims and hobbies, and ever subject to improper behavior. Boyhood is in constant dread of dangers arising at every step from fire, water, and air, which rarely cause problems in other states of life. Children are liable to very many errors in their plays and wicked frolics, in which all their wishes and attempts go beyond their capacities. Therefore, boyhood is the most dangerous stage of life. Children are engaged in false pursuits and wicked sports, and are subject to all other foolish childishness. Hence, boyhood is fit for the rod and not for rest. All faults, misconducts, and heartaches lie hidden in boyhood like owls in hollow caves. Shame on those ignorant and foolish people who falsely imagine boyhood as the most pleasant period of life. On entering school, a boy is subjected to corrections, which are as painful to him as goading and chains to an elephant. Boyhood, ever fond of toys and trifles, is constantly afflicted by a great many whims and hobbies and a variety of false fancies. Say, great sage, what difference is there between a child and a tree? Both have sensitivity, but neither is able to defend themselves from heat and cold. Children are like birds, subject to fear and hunger, and ready to fly about when impelled by them. Boyhood is the home of fear from all sides, such as from the tutor, father, mother, elder brother, and elderly children, and from everybody besides. Hence the hopeless state of childhood, full of faults and errors, and addicted to sports and thoughtlessness, cannot be satisfactory to anybody. I remember my youth. <laughs> I wish I could forget it. <laughs> Honestly, my youth was the most uncomfortable time of my life. How can I express it? It was just like being surrounded by idiots who were nevertheless in control of me because I was very intelligent from a very young age and also very spiritually aware from previous lives. 
So I could see right through these people. I could definitely detect all their emotions, their uncertainty, their pride, their anger and viciousness, their foolishness, the limits of their knowledge, and so on. And here I am, subject to their authority. And then, of course, there were the other kids. Vicious animals, just horrible. I could tell a million stories, but I think I'll settle on one. When I was four years old, I went Christmas shopping. And we were in the toy store. And my mother was, you know, kind of uh, hinting around like, well, what toy do you like? You know, <laughs> trying to find out what she should get me. And I was like, eh, I'm not really interested in any of them. You know, give me some good books. <laughs> I was already reading the New York Times at that age. So anyway, there was this other kid who was like, gimme, 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 I want this, I want that. Wah, mommy, give me this. And his mother said, well, we can't afford that toy right now. He wanted something really expensive, you know. And he just threw a complete hissy fit, falling on the floor, kicking, screaming, drooling, crying. And I was just looking at him like, ew. <laughs> How could you have so little self-respect as to act like such a jerk in a public place? Really, that was my attitude. Four years old. Now you see why I didn't get along with the other kids? They were horrible. And <laughs> of course, my parents were so clueless. They thought, well, oh, as soon as you get out of high school, you're going to get a job, just like we did, right? And I'm going, uh-uh, no, <laughs> thank you. I had two scholarship offers, one to MIT in nuclear physics, which I rejected, and the other one to a local conservatory of music in composition, which I accepted. And so they covered my tuition, but not much else besides. So I got a job working as a computer technician huh, in 1965 and put myself through college, living off campus, driving my own car, a red uh, Triumph TR4, in case you're interested. <laughs> and I didn't even graduate because I got hired right out of college and went to work for a big ad agency in New York, making uh, uh, commercials and movie soundtracks for TV. So that lasted for about a year and a half. And then I realized, wait a minute, I'm over 21. I can go anywhere. I can do whatever I want. So, <laughs> I sold my Triumph, bought a van, fixed it up, and went out to the West Coast and became a hippie. <laughs> and I just wandered for several years without any fixed plan, picking up gigs here and there, you know, just by chance. I hung out a lot in Marin County near the ranch uh, of the Grateful Dead. I had met a lot of musicians and stuff like that. Actually, there's long periods of time that I had no idea. <laughs> I have no memory of what I was doing. I guess I was having fun, huh? But anyway, I got childhood over with as quickly as possible. I became responsible for myself. I took myself out of so-called adult supervision and I went and lived the life I wanted to live as soon as I possibly could and still take good care of myself. I didn't want to wind up strung out on, on Hate Street uh, panhandling. So when I had some money, then yeah, I did my thing. And that's how I met my spiritual master. And that really determined the next 30 years of my life. 
and so on and so forth. So that was a time for me when I put childhood behind me and I got on with my real life. And I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad I got out of the system. I'm so glad I saw it early on for what it really is, which is just a social control mechanism. Uh, for stupid people who, who, who have no purpose in life or who have forgotten their purpose that they were born with, that they were created for, and gone along with ordinary society, which is nothing but an exploitive financial game. I feel really sorry for those people. Like the other kids in the alpha class in my school, they all went to top colleges. MIT, Stevens Tech, uh, Caltech, you know, like that. And they got advanced degrees. Many of them became doctors and like that. And they got what they wanted materially. But a few years back, about 10 years ago, I had a little project where I tried to contact people from my past. And these people were like burnt out. They were ruined. They're like, you know, getting into senility already. I'm just reaching my peak. <laughs> Honestly, I'm having a great time. I'm having so much fun. I live all alone. I spend hours every day in meditation. And I'm just independent. <laughs> I don't need anybody to tell me what to do, to structure my time. Huh? And I love it. And so this is really the aim of human life, liberation. Liberation in the external human part of life and liberation in the inside, internal, spiritual side of life. And until a person gets on the path to liberation, I say they aren't really living. They aren't really reaching for their potential as a human being. They aren't really becoming an autonomous adult, but they're just going along with the crowd, being swept along by the uh, conventions of society. And the conventional life is mediocre. It has to be. To have a great life, to be all you can be, you have to go beyond it. That's why I counsel people, huh? get your chart done, look at your astrology, find out what you came here for, what your challenges are, what the lessons are available to you in this life, and, and also see if you have moksha karaka, if you have a chance to become liberated in this life. Actually, I believe everyone has a chance. Everyone has an opportunity. And it's usually in the form of meeting or contacting or even just hearing about a self-liberated soul, huh? a self-realized soul, a great guru or teacher or something like that. And what happens with most people is they say, oh, it's a cult. Or, oh, I could never put myself under that kind of authority. But yet... Their wife bosses them around. Even their kids manipulate them in different ways. What to speak of their boss huh? and the, the government, taxes and the whole thing. Huh? Their whole life is under control from one end to the other. And they say, oh, I could never surrender to a guru. But a guru, at least a real guru, has your best interest at heart. When I approached my Adi Guru, Srila Prabhupada, now, a lot of people criticize his teaching, and I understand that. It's very, very uh, sectarian, <laughs> very fundamentalist. However, as a human being, you could not find a better master. You could not find a better father figure. You could not find a better leader than Srila Prabhupada. And he recognized me right away, and he gave me free reign of his temples. I could go anywhere in the world and live for free 
and just like chant and play music a few hours a day. And that was considered my service. <laughs> Terrible, wasn't it? <laughs> but he also taught me how to write and edit. And I became an editor on some of his books. So I learned Sanskrit and Bengali. And that's how I got into this whole <laughs> crazy life that I've had. <laughs> so when opportunity knocks, hello, take the choice, go for liberation. Even if you suffer materially as a result, and I have suffered materially a lot, mostly by people rejecting me and uh, betraying my trust. But hey, that's in my chart too. Saturn retrograde in the fifth house in Cancer. What are you going to do? They, it's not their fault. It's my karma. But guess what? That karma has driven me to become completely autonomous, self-sufficient and derive my happiness from God. So it all works out in the end. If you take the chance to go for self-realization. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam